All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody. And uh, here we have a session with uh, with uh, Jason uh, Kalayara from Amp Robotics called Unlocking Real-Time Visibility into Recycling Material Flow. Jason uh, has spent 15 years working in robotics and starting companies that apply robotics to last mile, deliver last mile delivery, aerial transportation, and other uses. And luckily for the Earth, Jason is now applying his talents to climate as head of engineering at Amp Robotics. And Robotics is using uh, just uh, incredible robotics and computer vision technology to solve recycling and this way to help us avoid the emissions associated with producing materials that we could recover from waste instead. And today Jason will talk to us about their work on using computer vision to improve the observability and efficiency of recycling operations. All right, take it away, Jason. Great, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, great, so hi everyone. Uh, uh, as, as mentioned, so my name's Jason. Uh, what I think I'd like to do here is just spend uh, just like a, a minute kind of introducing the company. I'm going to go a little bit into uh, the background, just high level background of recycling and how the operations work, and then dive deeper into how machine learning and AI and generally are being applied there um, to, to really revolutionize things. So high level, uh, AMP is a company that's been around for uh, about eight years at this point. Uh, we have hundreds of systems that actually span multiple continents. A lot of that is focused in the United States, but we uh, do have uh, some robots uh, in Japan as well as uh, starting to get into the EU. Uh, and in the States, I'd say that at this point, we're, uh, we're likely just a little bit shy of being in more than half the states. Um, as far as some of our customers, we're pleased to count uh, some of the largest operators in, in waste management and some of our customers have been using some of our systems. Um, and uh, we also have attracted a pretty world-class team of investors, um, Sequoia, XN, Google Ventures, Valor, uh, notable for early investments in companies like Apple, Google, and Tesla. So I feel like we're actually as a company in a really great uh, position and it's uh, just an exciting time to be able to be contributing here. Um, I, I wanted to set some context here. The, the company has a mission is to enable world without waste. And it we, we actually believe that this is possible, not something that is this uh, kind of vacuous statement of you know 50 year from now world that we'll actually never achieve. Um, we actually think this is quite tractable, particularly with the advent of machine learning. And so hopefully by the end of this uh, talk today, you think of this mission statement as not bombastic, but inevitable. Um, so before we dive into really kind of like the details in terms of the machine learning application here, I want to make sure that there's at least high level understanding in terms of how recycling actually works today, particularly a recycling facility, how that works. Um, so as, as a background here, the world is actually not doing super well with recycling. Um, it's estimated that we throw away uh, like something around like a quarter of trillion dollars worth of value every year and 87% um, of all the waste. Uh, just ends up in a landfill where it's incinerated, uh, which is uh, not not a great outcome at all. Um, to maybe uh, put a finer point on this, recycling, it, when you just think of like plastics and paper and aluminum globally, it's something like 9%, which means that um, that 91% uh, it, it just could be landfilled. It doesn't have the opportunity to be able to be reused again in some form, uh, which means it needs to be refined from crude oil which is uh, just a really kind of expensive process and contributes particularly to um, substantial greenhouse emissions. So it's estimated today that around 6% of oil uh, consumption like is due to plastics pr production. And that this is expected to increase pretty substantially through 2050, um, it, driven mostly by a population increase and, and more places in the world um, becoming um, more productive economies that generate a lot more plastic waste. Um, as far as the content, uh, like recycled um, materials or recyclable materials that don't end up in a recycling facility, let's say they end up in the ocean, uh, those will actually interact with sunlight to be able to generate methane, um, further contributing to climate impact. And it, it's, it's estimated too that uh, we have up to a billion tons of waste. It's a billion tons of waste every year that this is burned as one way to be able to manage it, which generates significant black carbon. Uh, and this can be like up to 5,000 5, times greater in its warming potential than CO2. So and there are direct and indirect uh, consequences of, of solving recycling. 
but I just wanted everyone to have an appreciation of that. So in terms of uh, where we are and kind of how things work uh, today, uh, I just want to spend uh, just a, a little bit of time on this. Some of you might be familiar with, with the blue bin. Uh, if you're fortunate to have access to this, this would be single stream recycling where you can put aluminum, you can put fiber materials, and you can put plastics all in that single container. Some places in the country don't have access to recycling at all, and some places have access to dual stream where you have to separate out the aluminum and plastics from the paper. But uh, if this is a familiar uh, commodity in the world to you, then congratulations, you have access to, to single stream recycling. So uh, material gets deposited there. Uh, it then gets collected. After that material gets collected, it gets dumped on a tip floor. Uh, the tip floor is what's seen in the graphic to the right. Um, all the collection trucks will just dump uh, massive amounts of material there, which are waiting to be fed into the recycling facility, uh, often by a loader as depicted here. Um, the next step in the process is that uh, really large, bulky, or hazardous items will be removed. Uh, think about this, uh, like perhaps a laptop. A laptop uh, doesn't seem like it's hazardous, but if it goes through a shredder, shredder and then uh, causes a fire, that's bad for the recycling facility. So uh, those things should be removed. Also things like fire extinguishers, propane canisters, uh, things that uh, we as uh, consumers probably wishfully think that we can recycle. Uh, can actually be quite a hazard for the recycling facility. So this pre-sort operation is really important to be able to ruin contamination. Uh, also things like large plastic bags, uh, which would just get gum up in the machines or um, large pieces of cardboard that just are unsortables. Um, it, if you can imagine any possible thing going into a recycling facility, I can guarantee you that has been there. That's yeah, a this is just really a kind of a, a critical role in making our recycling infrastructure actually work. So the next step is where some of the machinery starts to be introduced. Uh, the what's called 2D materials, that's fiber, that's uh, cardboard, and then uh, uh, paper or any type of mixed paper. Uh, that's going to be separated um, by some of the machinery, which is kind of graphically depicted here. And the things that were considered 3D, that's your aluminum and plastics and glass, all that stuff will fall in between these cams and these cracks. So light, light kind of things float on top and the heavy things float at the bottom. That's the first thing that happens mostly in a recycling facility. Um, the glass uh, will then be pulled out. Uh, most of recycling operations work in this way that they will exploit some fundamental physical property of the materials in order to be able to sort them. So fortunately or unfortunately, glass is brittle. And so the way the glass is sorted is that it's smashed up into a bunch of pieces, maybe by gravity dropping at 30 feet and it, uh, or putting it through some machine which pummels it to the point where all, all uh, glass particles are now less than one to two inches, in which case then you can kind of just sift them through the small glass particles go back and things like aluminum cans uh, and plastic bottles, which are much more resilient to that type of process, they don't, they don't break, they're not brittle, and they'll then get filtered out and continue on. So glass is taken out first in that way. Uh, the next thing that will happen is that uh, metals will be removed. Uh, for ferrous, ferrous metals, they can be removed with just a magnet. Once again, exploiting some physical property of the material, uh, ferrous things are uniquely magnetizable. So that's the mechanism that's used to remove them. And then for aluminum cans and other aluminum elements, um, uh, induced magnetism with the eddy current machine can, can be used effectively to be able to pull those material off the line. If this is done effectively, you should really just be left with a plastic stream. Um, and, and this is the next step in the process. Uh, a common uh, piece of equipment known as an optical sorter will be used, uh, which uses some type of near infrared or hyperspectral imaging system to be able to look at the material and then uh, do some simple computer vision to be able to detect uh, based upon certain wavelengths that uh, it belongs to this class or that class. Uh, after that detection happens, uh, pneumatic air jets will be used to as a selection mechanism to select an object out or to remove a contaminant that's not um, the, the other materials that surround it. Uh, well, it turns out that all of these processes are only so effective. Uh, and you need to be able to get to 95% purity. Beneath that, uh, you actually don't have a saleable product. And so if these, these bulk physics-based machines can get to something somewhere in the 80 to 90% purity. And uh, what is common practice then is that you'll have people 
that will be on the line that will be hand sorting. Uh, and their objective is to be able to remove the contamination such that you can get to this requisite purity for sale, which is roughly 95%. Okay, so let, now that we have a little bit of, uh, okay, and then, sorry, the, the last uh, step here is uh, for these products to be bailed, and this is how they're actually gonna be sold. Um, after they're stored inside a bunker, um, uh, which, is, which is the step after they've been manually quality controlled, then they'll be compressed into these uh, cubes um, known as bales with a machine called a baler. Um, uh, pretty amazing that this can actually be a volume reduction of something like 10 to 20 X. So it's a really efficient way to be able to uh, densely store materials. Uh, they'll be wrapped with baling wire and then they'll be stacked three high um, waiting for enough material to be collected so that it can populate a full semi trailer. And then that trailer gets shipped off to uh, a secondary processing facility or a paper mill or an aluminum mill. So that's, that's uh, pretty much high level how recycling infrastructure works today. Um, now, now let's enter uh, kind of the era of, of AI-based recycling. And this is where I think things are getting really exciting. Um, with an AI-based system, which is intelligence-based as opposed to mechanically based, uh, you actually can get to something which is 100% like purity and 100% uh, recovery. Uh, and and that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, instead of doing this process where we're getting to 80% and then we're having people kind of do this manual quality control application, it is theoretically possible that you could get to 100% purity with perfect intelligence on the very first pass, uh, which represents an entirely new cost paradigm uh, and performance capability for recycling facilities. Um, you, you also wouldn't be constrained by physical geometry, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later, but that's um, for the ability for recycling facilities to be dynamic uh, and be able to reconfigure uh, and really respond to what's in front of them. Uh, it turns out it's a, a pretty, uh, pretty powerful capability uh, to make them resilient to um, the changing of the seasons. So I, Maybe one way to contextualize this is that uh, there's been two major uh, probably technology advancements in recycling in the last 40, 50 years, because uh, recycling has only been around for around 50 years. The first is when it got started, it was really leveraging a lot of the technology that had matured in mining and agricultural industries and apply them to sorting and sifting things, which were a little bit smaller than, than boulders and crops. Um, the next major advancement happened uh, due to tech that was matured in the kind of like space age, in particular, um, hyperspectral imaging or near infrared imaging uh, and making that really cost effective was something that gave rise to these optical sorters, which is the primary way that plastics are recovered today. So that, that, that gave a single stream. So not having to think about, you know, do I put this in one of three different bins? Can I just have one bin? Optical sorters were pretty key to be able to making that a reality. Uh, then recycling facilities got higher throughput, they got higher recovery rates, uh, and we're able to achieve better purity because of this. Today, we're beginning an entirely new technology curve, uh, one that uh, offers significant reduction in cost, uh, recovery rates that do get to the point of being close to 100%. Um, the same with purity. Like we can theoretically get to the, the point where purity can be 100% if, if, uh, if knowledge is perfect. And we'll have much more granular sorting. Uh, with more granular sorting, this enables you to have much better recovery of commodities and also increase the value of the things that you're covering. Uh, and, and high level, this, this is how it, it breaks down. And your conventional sorting, I'm just using the example here of cardboard, where a, a piece of cardboard goes into a process there. And that cardboard today would have specific physical properties that has a, a, a surface area to weight ratio, which is it's like really really high and then it also is like relatively stiff. The, the machinery that's inside a recycling facility has no knowledge of that individual piece of material. Um, it just has these big bulky industrial machines that apply some type of like bulk property to them. In this case, using those rotating cams so that light things that are stiff float on top and the heavier, more dense things will fall in between, in between the cams and the cracks there. In an AI-based paradigm, it's very different. Uh, each individual item can be observed and with uh, combined with robotics and having a generic sorting device, um, 
you have the ability to have individual control over where every single item goes in a recycling facility and, and individual visibility into everything that happens there. This can be used um, pretty profoundly in sorting, but also as a feedback mechanism in terms of creating visibility to what's actually flowing through a recycling facility. So I'd like to talk about three, three areas that's, um, that AMP Robotics is applying this today. Um, uh, Cortex being a quality control robot, Vision being the, the real-time feedback mechanism um, by putting computer vision systems pervasively inside a recycling facility. And what happens when you put a lot of this technology together and you rebuild recycling from the ground up around AI. And in the image left, this is what depicts uh, the flagship product for the for AMP, um, as we call Cortex. Cortex uh, is uh, primarily used in a quality control application. So it, in, it's shown here, this is a facility in Florida um, where it's, it's actually the largest installation of robots uh, in the world that we're currently aware of. And, and there's a couple of different applications that'll be shown here. In some cases, we're cleaning up a, a plastics line. In some cases, we're, we're cleaning up a fiber line and just removing some of those contaminants there. But primarily, this is, uh, this is a predominant application for Cortex. Um, placed on a line, uh, the computer vision de detects everything that's on a line. Uh, it's, it is um, programmed to be able to select the items that should be removed. And, um, and all items that uh, appear as contaminants would then be removed and put in a bunker for downstream processing. Um, just uh, looking into Cortex and a little bit more deeply, there's just a few pieces that make us up. Uh, one is this overall cabinet. Uh, the cabinet has uh, really the brains uh, inside there. So it's kind of the embedded computer would be inside there. Um, there's a computer vision system, which exists uh, on the belt, which is uh, illuminated and it looks down on objects that it sees. And then there would be a robot cell and the robot cell uh, would have one or two robots depending on the width. Uh, we use an off-the-shelf robot. Uh, it's a Delta arm style robot commonly used inside manufacturing uh, pick and place operations. Um, taking a little bit deeper look there, we have this Delta arm robot, which is off the shelf. And as far as the business end there, this is all custom designed in-house in order to be able to have reliable picking operations. Um, the team actually uh, iterated for about three years in order to be able to find something that, that worked robustly in this particular application. So it might not look like very much, but the vacuum gripper is very important for the overall success of this. This is a quick uh, snapshot from our lab in terms of what this looked like. Uh, in this case, it's picking milk carts Belt cartons, because of the way they're crinkled, is actually something that's really difficult to be able to do successfully. Uh, in this particular case, you see that uh, all items are being detected upstream. And then when they get to the robot cell, uh, they're selected for a selection here. In this particular case in our lab, things will just recirculate indefinitely. Um, but in, in an application, uh, in a customer facility, this would either be items that we're picking for recovery or the removal of contaminations. So we, we talked about one of those applications that's quality control. There are some real benefits from being able to use this. Um, a robot itself can, can sort uh, two times the rate of a person. Actually, we, we have seen uh, one robot in a certain application was able to do three times. Average person will sort around 40 objects per minute. And in the application uh, for um, that I'm speaking about, we actually have seen as much as 120 picks uh, per minute from a robot. Um, Robots have the benefits of working 24-7. You know, they don't need breaks. They just need electricity and air. They're happy. Uh, and they're also remarkably consistent. So the, you know, um, if it's 2 in the morning, the robot's going to pick just as successfully as it would at 2 in the afternoon. And that's maybe something that's a little different with person. Uh, and it's also a, a lower cost solution, which enables the recycling facilities to operate more profitably and therefore recover more material. Uh, the other application I'll just speak about quickly that's commonly used uh, uh, in addition to the quality control one is that there's all this material that would just end up in the landfill. And it's after it's been processed by all the machinery, there's a single line, it's called the residual line. Um, and there's actually a lot of a good stuff that's still in there. Uh, there can be an application for a last chance 
type of mechanism to be able to have just one last opportunity. Sometimes that's a bunch of people that are staffed for that. Um, it's common that our robots will be installed there um, recovering any valuable commodity and then putting it back in circulation. Um, so that's, that's one application, that's Cortex. The next application uh, that I wanna talk about, um, maybe uh, most relevant to, to maybe the interest of the audience here is uh, what we call a vision. Vision is just the idea that you have a computer vision system that can uniquely identify every single material that it sees and you can distribute them uh, without the recycling facility. To appreciate why this might be valuable. Uh, today, uh, the recycling industry doesn't, doesn't really have very much visibility into what's going on with their process. You know, if um, a, a more sophisticated operation would have some understanding of mass that's going in and weighing the mass that's going out, but there's no concept of what's actually the material composition that's flowing through the facility right now. Uh, what is the value of the material that's flowing through? Has it changed in some way? Are each of the machines that are set up to do a particular task, are they actually performing that task well or not? There's no visibility here, uh, which means that operationally, it's quite a difficult problem to solve. Um, and, and in practice, you have a bunch of people who are just walking around constantly looking for problems or opportunities, and then they do happen quite often. So there's, there's primarily two benefits that, they, that you, you can have here in terms of installing vision systems throughout the facility. The first is this anomaly detection. Uh, and that means that if you have a vision system before and after, or if you just have that in a particular point, you know that the stream should look like X composition and that it ends up looking like Y composition, you can alert and uh, communicate that something is wrong and you should do something about it. Uh, the other really major uh, application here is to be able to have a certification authority to be able to definitively say, what is the purity inside that bail? Uh, no one can answer this question today. Uh, the, the overall uh, practice for it is that you would make product and then occasionally um, you would take a bail and you would split it open and then you would manually count every single object and you would take all the objects that are contaminants and then you would weigh them and weigh all the ones that are the target material and you come up with this overall purity and just assume that going forward that that's the purity that you're producing. Um, it's, it's like a really crude, really manual process with really low fidelity because of how labor intensive and expensive this would be. Um, it's, it's not commonly done more than once a month at max. Um, in most cases, only a couple times a year. So here's kind of a, a little bit deeper dive with those two applications I just spoke about. In terms of uh, real-time monitoring of, of bail purity, uh, well, in this graphic that we looked at earlier, uh, where there are a bunch of people that were doing manual quality control, cleaning up the product and before it would be stored in bunkers, well, we can install vision systems just before that material gets to those bunkers so that you can count everything and, and be able to say uh, with some certainty what the purity is of that particular product. Um, the, and this is a really big deal uh, just because if you don't get to 95% purity, you don't have a saleable product. And it could be the case that your buyer would then take one of, one of the bales, uh, break them open and kind of visually look at a high level uh, for some contamination. If contamination is found, the entire trailer could be rejected. So that could be the difference between your facility being profitable or not because we're talking about razor thin margins. So the ability to be able to confidently make consistent product, which is saleable at good purities is really important for the overall health of recycling facilities. In terms of how you can put this uh, overall system together, uh, we've built a, a product that we call Clarity. And, and it's, it's really an analytics uh, dashboard to be able to look at um, all the vision systems that would be in a recycling facility and to be able to extract insights. In some cases, you might want to look before and after a piece of machinery. Uh, and let's say that machine is designed to be able to remove cardboard from the stream. And before you see the material composition is around 65% cardboard. And after, you would ideally, you would expect that that's 0%. But if you're seeing 10 to 30%, then you know that something's wrong. Maybe it's holiday season and there's so much cardboard that it's just surging over and you're losing a whole bunch here. So there might be a more optimal configuration of your recycling facility to maximize value extraction. Uh, it's, it's incredibly difficult to be able to do this without insight. And so with the computer vision systems that we're building, 
with this dashboard and analytics tool um, installed as the front end to that. We can enable new types of actions and optimizations, which are here for like heretofore, like just strictly not possible because that data didn't exist. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about before diving a little bit deeper into the, uh, the kind of like machine learning here and some of the new challenges that we're seeing is talk about uh, well, what happens if you start it over? Uh, the existing paradigm today is all built on this idea that you have uh, these large mechanical machines and then you have something that cleans them up. And that can be a person or that could be an AI device. But what if you flip this upside down and um, built a facility that, that didn't require this two-step process, just used uh, machine learning and robotics to be able to sort at the requisite purity just in the first pass. So you're really looking at the opportunity to be able to redesign recycling from scratch based upon uh, AI and particularly ML. And so we've just done that. We've announced this actually about a month ago that for the, the past year, we've built pilot uh, facilities as well as two production facilities that are operating today um, that, that do just this. So I'd like to talk about them. Um, the Today, you would have material that goes to a recycling facility would be processed. And in your best case scenario, you're gonna recover about 90% of the valuable commodities. The more common uh, implementation or performance rather would be something that's around 70%. Um, what remains, that's just gonna to go to landfill. And so that's where a lot of the, the lost recyclables come from, either from, uh, well, people don't have access to curbside recycling, so it just goes directly to landfill. But even the case where they do, Recycling facilities are only so good. Like they're like no recycling facility is recovering 100%. That's really in this 70 to 90%. And there's some some cases which are um, as low as 40 or 50%. But but the majority hang in the 70 to 90%. Well, we found out with uh, with computer vision, we can we can build a new type of application here where we take uh, all of that material which which still has a lot of good stuff in it, still has a lot of recyclables in it. Uh, along mixed with things which are truly landfillable. Uh, we could take that as an input stream and we could extract nearly all the remaining value out of that. Um, therefore, uh, like substantially increasing landfill diversion um, and, and creating some value, more value out of the recycling ecosystem. This is a, uh, a pretty big shift in terms of the paradigm of recycling facility. The way this is built is entirely based upon uh, in an observer and then a generic actor. And we just have like a variety of those that are configured inside the system, um, which means that we can do things that were not possible before. Uh, and, and the paradigm looks very similar to uh, what some might experience today of a car that has some self-driving capability. Um, I'll borrow this from Tesla. Like a, in a vehicle uh, is owned, it has some capability, it receives a software update and actually has better driving capability. Uh, this paradigm does not exist at all for uh, the recycling industry, primarily because uh, the machines are electromechanical with, with very little like software added functionality. If you are building around the premise of uh, intelligence, that's, that's really different. Uh, today, we would be able to sort to some reference purity and recovery. But if we update the sorting software, if we update the neural network, then we actually can increase the purity and we can increase the recovery of commodities. If we see that the material stream uh, changes pretty dramatically, we can reconfigure the overall plant design to be able to maximize the value of extraction of those materials. That's never been something that's possible before uh, where you have these uh, commodity specific sorting devices that are like electromechanically oriented and therefore like can adapt to, uh, to, to changing tides in, in the material stream. So this is the first time ever that we have a software defined facility. Um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. So in terms of what, what powers all, all of this, we call this neuron and I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper here. Neuron is just, it's the, the brains of the operation. That's the camera, computer, um, that's the software, the neural network, everything that makes uh, our machines go in this case. As far as what it is, uh, we actually rely strictly on RGB sensing. This is not, uh, we don't use any kind of exotic near infrared or hyperspectral imaging. It's all intelligence based with commodity uh, computer vision cameras that are available off the shelf. Um, we have 
really integrated sense and compute. And that's really critical for our application. Uh, it's uh, the environments that we're in are often are very ruggedized. Uh, you think of it's so dusty that you'd have about a centimeter of dust accumulation per hour. Just like to think about that. It's like, that's so much dust. Uh, it's high humidity, high temperature, high vibration. So like a pretty challenging environment uh, from like building a product perspective. And it's hard real time. The difference between tens of milliseconds is the difference between uh, performance and just not suitable for the application at all. Uh, so that's, that's something that's particularly unique uh, for, for solving things for recycling. As far as what it would look like, uh, here's a little video on the right of uh, what an actual feed of our computer vision uh, system looks like. Today we support dozens of categories. Uh, we're up to around uh, 60 right now. Uh, we have detection accuracy like upwards of 97% for, for some categories, um, which is really impressive considering the just many different permutations of uh, all the different ways that an object could be crushed or presented. Uh, it's really quite inc incredible that we're able to achieve that. And then we're also operating across a, a variety of different, um, different verticals. There is what we think of as uh, recycling. Uh, that's what's in your, what's in your blue bin. Um, there's e-waste recycling, and then there's also construction and demolition recycling. So we have uh, we have computer vision systems in all of those applications. We make pretty extensive use of an NVIDIA ecosystem. Um, we have uh, that's both on the training side and then also on the inform side. Uh, on the training side, we leverage cloud computing, but also we've we've built a, a cluster. Uh, local to be able to meet some of our workload demands. Um, and, and the objective there is to be able to just have like a super high frequency of iteration cycles. We find that that's really critical to keeping a high pace of innovation. Uh, we also make pretty extensive use of uh, optimization frameworks in this one particular case here, TensorRT, um, uh, a function of the NVIDIA ecosystem. And for us, uh, what that really does is that we have a hard latency budget that we can exceed. But if we can accelerate the inference time, then we can invest in things like heavier backbones or different heads of the networks or um, uh, different ways to be like more expensive in that way, subject to this hard ceiling of the latency constraint. And we only require something that's like on order of 20 frames per second. So those are the constraints. And then we use optimization to be able to enable like much more uh, complex or like novel network architectures. In terms of what uh, the vision system can see today, um, we collapse them down to, to these macro categories. I mentioned before, like depending on how you, how you look at it, uh, we can support today up to like 60 plus categories. There's also um, the subcategories beneath them. Uh, so we can look at opacity, we can look at color for, for any one of the objects that are inside here, for example. And so I, I'd like to spend maybe just a moment here to talk about some of the unique challenges that we have in deploying this real life version of machine learning in the wild in a, in a super difficult environment. That the first is that uh, objects are really quite irregular uh, and, and that makes identification really challenging. Uh, for the application here, we just look across the row of fiber. Um, you might be detecting something which is cardboard, but cardboard could you might think, well, cardboard's brown and that should be a pretty easy thing to detect. Well, except that cardboard could be um, colored. It could, it could be some like text on it. Um, it could be ripped in half. It could be in any possible shape and size. There's nearly infinite variations of what cardboard could be presented as. Um, aluminum is another one. Aluminum can, can be crushed in, in just so many different ways. So we have to build uh, an object detection framework that's really robust to every possible way that they can detect. And then the last just shows uh, another one of those um, commodities, uh, HDPE. Uh, and, and the HBT is colored, the natural colored you can think of as a laundry detergent bottle and natural you can think of as a, as a milk jug. But uh, whether it's colored or natural, each of these can also be smashed in, in any possible uh, permutation. So the difficulty for us is not just recognizing a particular object, but in recognizing every possible like, permutation 
sort of smushing that object, um, which, which means that in like practice, this is really a data problem. Uh, there's also some funny uh, confusions that can come up. We didn't train the neural network to be able to understand that uh, cows were associated with milk cartons. There just happens to be like a sufficient number of milk cartons in the data set that uh, have pictures of cows on them that the network associated cows with milk cartons. But uh, some products um, you know, don't, don't <laughs> follow that orientation in terms of like a cow corresponding to a milk carton. So you might have something where it's an HTTP bottle which, which is overwrapped with something with a picture of a cow. And so these would be mis misclassified and actually show up in a milk carton classification. And it's problems like these that are really like needle in a haystack. Uh, it does require like a, some, some pretty interesting infrastructure to be able to try and detect those. Okay, so just in, just in summary here, and I wanna make sure I leave some time for a Q&A, uh, just wanna take away like a few high level points here that like AI really is, and, and I mean machine learning really is the next big technology curve for cycling. And we're just, we're just in the infancy of that. Um, really in terms of a sorting application, uh, the combination of being able to uniquely detect every single material and then having a policy that you can apply with a robot is, is really the fundamental concept that opens up this new paradigm for cycling sortation. Um, hundreds of categories today are possible and there's no reason that thousands won't be possible uh, in the near future. And uh, secondary sorting like, is one of the tractable ways that we can actually get to zero waste. So if we're, if we're having a secondary facility, which is behind every primary facility, then you can ensure that uh, you're recovering nearly 100% of the valuable commodities. So I'd, uh, I just wanted to leave you with uh, maybe a bit of inspiration here in terms of what, what the future holds, particularly for uh, AI in recycling. Uh, it's humbling to imagine that recycling isn't that old. It's actually like roughly 50 years old. So there, is, there are people uh, that are alive today that were there for the birth of recycling. I mean, some of us might have thought about recycling. It's just been something that's been around for like quite a long time. And it really hasn't. 50 years is kind of just a blink of an eye. Uh, with respect to our species. Um, it's, it's incontrovertible that resources on this planet are finite. And so it, if you believe that, then recycling is absolutely inedible. We, we have to solve this. We have to get much better about using the resources that we have on the planet. So in the future, <clears throat> where AI will take us is that we will be able to get to something which is 100% purity and 100% recovery. Um, the limit today is just a function of intelligence, but as machine intelligence improves and there's, there's, uh, there's no perceived uh, hard ceiling on that, it just seems a matter of time uh, before we get to something which is a perfect observer. Like uh, by using these secondary sorting facilities and having the ability to have 100% purity and recovery, that is the tractable way that we will get to zero waste. If you have perfect recovery mechanisms and you distribute them, throughout the world and they're economically operated, then there's, there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to get to zero waste. And then uh, and in the not too distant future, and we've already demonstrated that this is, this is possible, we not only will be able to identify things like um, paper cups, uh, plastic cups, we'll be able to identify uh, the actual brand that's associated with this. So and I think that that opens the door to an entirely new uh, paradigm in terms of corporate accountability for contribution to the waste stream. So oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed this talk. Uh, maybe just as, as, as something interesting, the time that you've been watching this talk, uh, we diverted nearly half a million objects from landfill, and that's from our recycling facilities and the robots that are operating. So uh, thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that might come up. Yeah, thank you so much, Jason. This is uh, fascinating. I guess not many people who work in machine learning can say that their models work well on literally piles of garbage. <laughs> it's it's pretty impressive. Uh, so we, we have one uh, one question from uh, Kenji uh, Matsuoka. And uh, Kenji is asking, this is more about recycling generally than uh, about AMP. Uh, but if a material is composite, uh, such as paper bonded to a metallic foil, should we assume that it's not recyclable? Uh 
that's like a, a there's a, a complex a answer to that question. I think, mm -hmm. um, like in the case of, here's like a, in that particular case, no, that, that would likely be something that would be discarded because it's, it's bonded in that way. Another possibility is that there would be a PET bottle and something like an HTP cap, in which case there actually is a process for uh, recovery of that primary commodity and then chemically dissolving the contaminant. So in that particular case it is, but in your particular case, it would not be. Got it, um, thank you. So I have one more question uh, from myself. So from what I heard, please uh, tell me if this is right or not. Uh, like the thing with purity and recycling is similar to uh, like quality of machine learning models where if once you start approaching 100%, it gets like several times more valuable if you're able to squeeze that extra um, that extra you know nugget of purity. Is that, uh, is that the case with recycling or no? Yeah, yes, uh, that's actually uh, like a really great point. So uh, mm -hmm. if the value, let's say the value of a, a commodity, a plastic commodity is uh, uh, making something up, something like a $1,000 uh, a ton right now, and that's sort of 95% purity. Uh, the market actually stated that if you could get uh, somewhere between 97 to 99% purity, you could between double to triple the value of that commodity. Wow. Just today, yeah. that's financially intractable. Uh, because mm -hmm. you would have to have people that would just be like sorting and sorting and sorting mm -hmm. in order to be able to make that work. But mm -hmm. if we could get there, then you could nearly double to triple the value of certain commodities, in particular PET, there's an established market for that. Mm -hmm. So essentially, that means that uh, the work you guys are doing, it's not just making existing facilities like more profitable, but it's making the whole thing like an attractable business to get into so i suppose there would be a lot more recycling facilities just coming in line because now they can figure out a way to to do it profitably does it sound right that's the idea mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see if it pans out mm -hmm. uh, that's the idea so far it's working mm -hmm. awesome and uh, i'm curious if you could speak to you know the other bottlenecks in the material recovery chain apart from sorting like are there any other problems that you're aware of that are of relevance to machine learning professionals perhaps or just like, what else is it bottlenecked by really? No, I think uh, collection, this is not necessarily something which is machine learning based, but there's, there maybe are opportunities for uh, machine learning in here. A collection is, uh, is, a, is a big problem uh, in that uh, some people have access to collection uh, and it's also something that uh, you, you commonly have to pay for, uh, but there's no, there's no method today to be able to understand like when you're offering things for collection, that's, that's actually, that's valuable commodities. Uh, there actually could be like a future version of this where collection is not something that you have to pay for. Collection is something that you get paid for. Mm -hmm. But the, the ability to be able to detect all of that material, which is being dumped into the collection truck, like in, mm -hmm. and be able to assess the value of that, that's a gap today that could be filled by computer vision and machine learning. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you know that's missing today got it um yeah so on that on that uh, note about getting paid for collection there is actually a company that i know uh, i don't know if they use machine learning or not but they're called it uh, sorry i sent it just to you they're called uh, iterant and like that's their whole thing they're trying to make uh, create in financial incentives for everybody in the material recovery chain so that like manufacturers are incentivized to make stuff that can be recycled uh, the you know the ones who do the collection are get, getting paid for it the ones who do the sorting get paid for it and so on so um there is a lot of work going on in the circular economy space like sorting is an incredibly important part of it but there's lots yeah. of work for you to do in other spaces of it too so yeah, kenji absolutely. submitted another question uh, you mentioned up to 97 percent accuracy of sorting are you able to share the accuracy for some specific categories uh, for some specific categories, uh, no, I would say that that's, uh, that's, that's confidential to the company. Uh, mm -hmm. What I can say is that 97% uh, would not be common. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be like uh, not anomalous, but uh, there would only be a handful of categories mm -hmm. that, that would be able to be that performant. It would depend on the application mm -hmm. uh, because of some of the challenges that I meant this like infinite permutation uh, mm -hmm. of the materials makes robust detection really, really, really difficult. So, um, right. yeah, mm -hmm. in practice, your F1 scores are not, are not all 97%. Makes sense. And just final thing in the remaining minute, can you talk a bit about like what kind of people are you hiring for? Like what kind of roles? Uh, 
Oh, uh, all of them. So uh, it, like, uh, what's what's kind of awesome about AMP is that it's really a really full stack company. So at first, like we are hiring machine learning engineers. We are hiring uh, um, what we call data material specialists. It's really kind of an operation role that works in partnership with the machine learning team. We're hiring mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, uh, program managers, software engineers, people that work uh, on devices, kind of C, C++, people that work in kind of cloud applications. So from, from the edge all the way up to the cloud, um, as well as in, in machine learning, the company is hiring. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for that. And this is a great illustration to the thesis that like you don't need to be a climate specialist to work in climate. Uh, like these are all like generic general purpose yeah. roles. You can use your existing skills. Yeah. yeah and I, so I much, certainly Jason. didn't know very much uh, before I joined the company about uh, two and a half years ago. So you absolutely don't need to learn, uh, don't need to know anything about climate in order to be able to be impactful here. We'll teach you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. Thanks everybody for attending. See you in the next sessions.